I have the pleasure to introduce you to Marta Bogdanska, photographer, filmmaker, and artist behind the book Shifters, a 14 chapter, 850 page artist book that brings together Marta's many years of research in archival material related to the use of animals by Western militaries, intelligent agencies, and police force since the late 19th century. This book brings us closer to the animals. We want us to pay more attention to them, their rights that have been neglected. Marta is part of Cracker Photo Month's main exhibition program with a project, which is not just a book, but it's also an exhibition. And Laskuna Photo knows Marta since she was our last year's photographer in residence. With us is also poet and publisher, Stefan Lorenzotti. He's from Brooklyn, New York. He's the editor of Boardwolves and Micropress, which he runs out of a cabin in the Polish Highlands. He has edited and overseen the text in the book, and is also one of the authors in the book. Let's start with just, where does this idea come from, from the beginning, from you, Marta, to create this book and collect, I mean, and research and archive of all these different images of animals being used throughout warfare and, and in police forces and so on? Where, where, how did that come across in the beginning? It's, a, it's, it's kind of a complex process. It actually started few years ago, I can't remember exactly, maybe even four or five years ago when I was still living in Lebanon, I started coming across uh, this uh, newspaper and media articles and uh, information about different animals being arrested for spying or kind of being arrested as, as agents nowadays, you know, so kind of very uh, normal media article telling you that uh, a pigeon in India was arrested for flying from Pakistan and is allegedly a spy. So I started collecting this, this, these articles and I started noticing certain gestures also because usually when they're published uh, first uh, they appear in local media, be it in, I don't know, Farsi or Arabic, and then they get translated, like picked up by mainstream Western media and translated and published by mainstream, you know, BBC, New Yorker and all these other outlets. And there was very often there was this kind of twist or gesture which would kind of ridicule or make fun a little bit of this kind of alle alleged spying of animals because these articles are really between 2005 and now so <laughs> very 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 uh, contemporary things and I started looking at this gesture and some of the articles would kind of give you more information about how actually even CIA or other agencies uh, used to use animals in their programs and they had special programs designed for animals uh, to, to use animals in you know trainings and uh, for them to carry cameras and all this kind of crazy stuff that I was going to discover later but at that point I really had this collection of articles and the title somehow I don't know why the title kind of came to you know it's kind of one of those maybe intuitive moments where you have a title you don't really know yet what it all, all gonna be about what, what what does it mean really and a few years later actually beginning of 2019 I started doing the archival research after thinking how I can approach this topic um, I had a few other ideas but then it that didn't really work so I, I started researching their archives but I basically started from internet I didn't start from, uh, let's say, national archives or war archives. I really started uh, <laughs> just going through internet and having this kind of associative research where you like find one photo and then you follow to another photo and then to another photo. And this kind of started growing and I started seeing things and, and patterns and repetitions. And I discovered that there's so many images uh, out there, you know, scattered around different collections, private collections, Flickr, Pinterest, of course, and all these other sources. But there was not much in this kind of critical um, research, and they were just more like anecdotal um, collections or stories or, or certain images of certain animals. So at the same time, of course, I come from a philosophical background, so I started my let's say more theoretical research. I started reading and uh, coming across several um, important names in animal studies. Uh, and one of them was Eric Baratte, who's a French historian who coined this term actually, history from an uh, animal point of view, which be began, <laughs> well, became kind of a light in the tunnel for me. It kind of guided my research. And I realized that what I'm doing is 
is very similar to what he does. Of course, he, he's a historian. He does it from a very uh, different perspective. But I wanted to kind of look at the visual material that I was gathering in that way. And of course, then the one more important maybe aspect of that research was that I realized that uh, the term that I was using, agent, spy, was actually a very good entry point to the whole project, which became more than just studying the archives, because agent on one hand means a spy and informant, but on the other hand, it means a subject doing action. So there you could immediately jump to terms like agency, intentionality, subjectivity, which kind of linked my diverse researches together. So from this archival research, I had immediately, you know, it was like a knot tying together all these things that were going on in my mind. So yeah, that was like the beginning. Yeah, and it's kind of within the book as well, you start with uh, images of the articles that was your starting point in a way. And then we go to this, there's a specific image in the beginning. There's this uh, rabbit, it's kind of a stage image. It looks like a rabbit is taking a photograph of a young girl. And it seems to be quite specific in the editing that is placed in the beginning. Can you tell us a little bit about that specific image and why it's like one of the first images you see in the book? Um, yes, of course. I mean, in my process, I, I usually combine like this conceptual way of thinking where I try to have at least the structure and the concept uh, more or less clear. But of course, then comes this kind of more intuitive, artistic uh, way of thinking where I allow myself to have more like <laughs> uh, crazy ideas and insert images that maybe kind of even seem to break a little bit out of that pattern to make them a little bit more nuanced. So I wanted that first chapter, which is called Natural Born Agents. Uh, I mean, the book has 14 chapters and I think each title now is very metaphorical and uh, kind of uh, gives a lot of different meanings and ideas for the, for the book. So, so in that first chapter, first of all, I wanted to kind of introduce people to that research that started the project. So I, I screenshot uh, some of the actual articles um, that I found. Uh, and then I wanted to introduce the project with a few images that could actually immediately make you think of, a, of a, an animal as an agent or animal as, a, as someone with agency. So that's why we have these images of the rabbit taking a photo because this is like such a human, I mean, at least used to be such a human affair because nowadays machines take pictures and we have all these other sorts of things happening. But so we have an elephant giving a, an interview to a radio, you know, all these things that are kind of immediately hinting at animals that could be spies. So that was the idea. And we have a few of those. And also at the cover, when you look, it was also a very intuitive choice that I didn't realize at the beginning that it will be so important. It's, it's, a, it's a picture from Library of Congress, and it only says that it's Brunhilde the cat, who is dressed in the Vikings armor and helmet. And there was not much more about this photo. But then while doing research, especially for this exhibition at Kraków Photo Month with my curators, we discovered that this is a Brunhilda was one of Valkyrias. So the, the Odin, the god Odin had their, his own army of Valkyrias, these beautiful women fighters. And they, they were shapeshifters, actually. They could change shape from women to swans. So, this be, so Brunhilda became like a guide uh, for this whole project. And now she's very important. And I, it was just an intuitive choice to, to put her on the cover at the beginning. You know, I didn't really know all these stories that were kind of building up while I was doing research for two and a half years. So, yeah. I think also, Maya, starting from, from you, is it also relating a lot to the animal rights and to be kind of, you know, there's a lot of exploration of animals and then so that you see the feel the burden as well in the heaviness of the book and the amount of images that you included in the book. Can you tell us a bit more about that starting point or that part of the book? Well, I mean, yes, this was very important for me to, um, to kind of make it visible and palpable somehow that, that the animals had, you know, suffered and made so much sacrifice and worked for us for so many hundreds of years. And I wanted to somehow have it visible in the book. So that was the question at the beginning, how to edit this huge material. Of course, I had to edit in the end, because at some point, I also started researching uh, 
more dedicated archives like national archives of different countries or war archives and, and places like this. So my, my own archive kind of became a huge repository of all these images, but I also wanted to keep that, that idea of internet uh, as a repository of all images and that kind of idea that fo I follow also, which is Ito Steyer uh, talking about the weak images. And she has this theory how weak images can kind of um, take over the world and become, you know, claim their positions. I wanted to kind of stress that also. So this book is so heavy and kind of printed in a way that looks like a Pulp Fiction book or like a, this kind of cheap novel that you can just buy and then read quickly and throw out, but it's huge, you know. So so you can feel immediately the, the, the work and the sacrifice and the pain and all these other emotions that I hope animals uh, you know felt and at the same time it kind of also hints at that idea that this this history is in a way known to us because it's everywhere if you start researching on the internet you will really find all these images scattered around but then it's not really still critically um, uh, um, reflected on enough you know I mean there's more and more of these coming animal studies are really growing and new materialist theories and philosophy are really building up on this idea of the other and animal as the other, but at the same time, it's still not in our consciousness, like the, the general consciousness, it's not functioning. So this was the idea for the book. Great, and to bring you in now, Stefan, when did you become part of this book? Because you have edited the text and written quite a few, lot of essays within the book as well. So how was that collaboration with you too? And when did that start? So I was originally brought on board to edit uh, the textual component of the book. And then at a certain point early on, sort of serendipitously, we, we ended up, uh, Marta and I had some wonderful conversations early on, really inspiring about the, the possibility, the potential for text in a book like this. And where you could have texts that were very fact heavy, um, contextualizing, the, the chapters, whether a chapter was on uh, Red Cross dogs, specifically rescue dogs during the First World War, et cetera, you could have a text that was uh, very uh, sort of more encyclopedic and that would be completely legitimate. We, we spoke though about the possibility, the potential to come at the text from a little bit more of a literary angle, a little bit more of a poetic angle uh, where we wouldn't necessarily give all the context. We wouldn't necessarily provide all the facts, uh, but we would, attempt to capture some essential element of what the photographs were showing, even if it was more subjective than objective, that would perhaps in the end accomplish a little bit more than if it were something that were fact heavy, to the extent that a reader might not retain all the information. And some of these, uh, actually pretty much every subject to fully contextualize, it's, over an, it's an overwhelming amount of information. It's an avalanche of information. So how can we come at it a little bit more poetically, even to, uh, to write a scene, so that the reader at least retains some very specific essential, perhaps even visual from the text, memory of the text. Marta was incredible. I mean, she was amazingly supportive uh, and, and receptive to this idea. I am a poet, I should say. I should back up and say that I'm a poet and I tend to write uh, micro poetry. So some of my poems are itty bitty little nutshell poems where I'm, I'm trying to, capture whatever it is that I that I want to convey in as few words as possible. So this was a really interesting challenge. Uh, so basically, in the end, I, I didn't end up editing, I ended up writing uh, about three quarters of the text. And then I, um, I reached out to three other writers uh, who I trusted and who I was just genuinely curious, what will, you know, I, uh, what will Helen write about uh, Soviet attempts to use moose as cavalry animals, etc, and then edited those texts. So in the end there, I, I think it's about 13 texts that all kind of come from an unconventional angle at these subjects. And in every case, it was about uh, how do I, what, what's, the, what's the angle into this that is perhaps not the conventional angle for approaching the subject. In, in the course of doing research, uh, I read, uh, I, I should begin by saying, I, I knew pretty much nothing about any of the subjects I wrote beforehand. And so as I began delving into Material, research material, primary source material, uh, it was a, it quickly became apparent that most of these animal histories, let's say particularly famous dog from World War I, 
Um, it was usually anecdotal. And as Marta says, there's very little that's analytical, very little that's reflective or comes at it from a more philosophical angle uh, or even an, an, an animal rights angle. It was all pretty much anecdotal, three quarters of the material. It was telling stories with an emphasis on, oh, isn't this charming? Isn't this so charming that the animal is saluting its human superior? Isn't it so charming that the animal had its own rations? And I found this really disturbing because uh, for the most part, just about every story I read, every story I researched, and every story I decided to focus on, with the exception of one, which I might mention later, Stubby, I found all of these stories pretty much uh, saddening across the board, and, and it was exploitative across the board. And yet three quarters of the writing was focusing on these sort of charming details uh, or sort of a more anthropomorphic approach to these stories. And like, oh, that's so, uh, it's so hilarious that Wojtek the bear was swallowing cigarettes, that he would smoke with the, uh, the, the Polish soldiers and they would give him cigarettes and he would eat them, isn't that hilarious? And then it doesn't mention that later on he died perhaps from because it was just destroying his lungs, um, you know, as you would imagine uh, eating cigarettes would do. And so I felt really strongly committed to not allowing myself to romanticize or to in any way treat situations comedically that were really not funny with a couple of exceptions. Um, but I think for the most part, like there's very little um, humor in my writing, I guess, for, for these subjects, because I just felt like, no, it's inappropriate. I see that in that essay you wrote, Stefan, about called Bite Suit, and it's kind of bringing us more into a contemporary time where uh, American police use dogs or train dogs to bite humans, actually, or to chase bad the bad guy or something as is as written and uh that adds another layer it kind of brought me back to more cu current times as well reading it uh, can you tell us a bit more about that text sure so a, a lot of the texts in the book i think uh first world war there, there, there's quite a bit on the first world war and and the second world war bites it was actually the first text i wrote and i uh i i had been going through the photographs for that chapter uh, that chapter is called discipline and punish and it's specifically about, more specifically about uh, police use of, of animals, of, of dogs, canine units. And I, I was really drawn to the images of uh, the training of the dogs. Uh, now, most of these images are from the uh, earlier part of the uh, 20th century. And basically you have this big poofy suit, you look like the Michelin man, and you have the dogs lunging at and, and biting the suit and, and sort of clinging on. And there are lots of these images repeating. So I, I became kind of interested in this bite suit. That was actually the original, uh, the original thing that I sort of latched onto. And so I began researching bite suits, which I'd never um, heard of or even realized there was such a thing. And I, I started finding them on Amazon and they're pretty expensive. They're like 2000 euros, you need an institutional budget. And that got me into researching bite suits. And um, I noticed that a selling point of all the bite suits, and again, these are expensive. So this is, this is really institutions like a police department are gonna be looking to buy these. A prominent selling point was allows the dog to bite everywhere and repeatedly. Um, so in other words, in the training of the dog, the dog could be trained to bite everywhere and repeatedly, which I found very disturbing that it was there as one of the reasons that you would buy that suit and then I ended up in researching a little bit going into canine units because we're at a time right now you know, in the United States where just about uh, in, addition to, um, in addition to unarmed black males being shot by the police uh, to an, an epidemic, uh, endemic degree, every, every week or so there's a video released of usually a, a black male being attacked by a police dog, often without provocation. And uh, one, one uh, prominent case, which I won't go into the details too much right now, it's in the text, but it was in Salt Lake City, Utah, where a, a man, uh, the police sicked a, a dog on a man in his driveway, um, and then later lied and said that he was threatening them, but video body cam footage, which went viral, showed that that was not the case. And so I went to the Salt Lake City Police Department, and it was interesting reading on their frequently asked questions about the canine unit dogs. 
you know, when the dogs do bite, they are trained to bite and hold the suspect until their handler is able to take over and place them into custody safely. This usually results in very minor injury to the suspect. So I was very interested in that, or, you know, that very minor injury. Uh, and the more I researched it, the more I realized, yeah, it's not very minor injury. And it's a very specific, uh, it's a very specific American that's getting bit repeatedly. And those are, those are black Americans. And eventually I went, I, I let, it led me to the Ferguson report, um, Department of Justice report on the Ferguson police department, where there's a section on canine dogs. And as I went, I got deeper and deeper into American history and into the really dark and ugly sides of American history, going back to the civil rights movement. There are many iconic images of white police officers in places like Alabama setting German shepherds on peaceful black protesters. And it took me even further back to slavery and um, white slave owners, well, obviously white slave owners using dogs, training dogs to specifically distrust their slaves in really horrific ways, having a slave beat a dog so the dog will distrust uh, slaves. And, and then uh, the idea was sending the, the dogs out to catch slaves that were attempting to escape to freedom. That, that was an example, Bite Suits the longest text, but it was an example of just beginning with one motif that Marta had focused on. And oh my gosh, you know, the, I was like, there, there is a book to be written here. In fact, there are books written on the subject about how canine dogs are not about protecting the public, even though on public television, it's always like, oh, look, the dogs are catching bad guys. And then at the end of the day, they just want their squeaky toy. Um, that's sort of how the local news covers it. But in reality, it's like, okay, this is about controlling a very specific part of the population. Uh, it was really important for me to have uh, to have this connection to also like, you know, all the other rereadings or rewritings of the of the history that that we're witnessing in the last uh, years, which is like the history from the point of view of minorities, all the hair stories. And I think this, this kind of project fits within this larger spectrum of trying to retell history from the peripheral characters or, or heroes, you know, that were always neglected. And so that was really interesting for me when Stefan brought the slavery period, because I think that's another example. And I was also super happy that, uh, you know, Barate accepted to write the preface because he also very much stresses this this continuation or this uh, uh, like being in line with all these other rewritings of history. So I thought that was a very important uh, um, kind of like a area to be in, you know. And Stefan, are there any other specific texts that you want us to dig a little bit deeper into that would also explain more of the content? Yeah, so uh, I think the Animal Partners Program, there's a lot there. Uh, the Animal Partners Program is uh, a CIA program that they ran during the Cold War for a number of decades up through the 1970s. And basically it was the CIA looking at ways to really to weaponize animals or to use them as intelligence gathering agents, as assets, uh, in most cases taking advantage of the fact that through some uh, really sensorial um, capability of the animal allowed animals to go to places to penetrate, uh, for example, dolphins swimming into Soviet harbors uh, to, to get to places where a human agent could not go. Um, one of the more remarkable ones, for example, it, 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 an example that I like is ravens that were trained to carrying list, uh, carry listening devices to particular windowsills of let's say a, a diplomatic building, diplomatic outpost, a raven would be trained with a laser pointer to carry a listening device disguised as a piece of slate up to a particular windowsill with windows open, drop the piece of slate and fly away. So anybody in the office would just have seen, you know, maybe noticed uh, the raven on the windowsill. Meanwhile, a, a listening device disguise, bug disguised as a part of a slate windowsill um, has been dropped. And so there was a lot of stuff like that. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of smiling. That's one of the ones that I think like I can be like, that's that's pretty cool about, but there were, the, the majority of these projects were pretty disturbing. Uh, and I think Acoustic Kitty is one that stands out to me as like humans are just awful. Uh, it was a cat that they cut open, the CIA, they wired it. They, they literally put audio equipment into the cat, a wire down the spine, an antenna in the tail. Then they sewed the cat back up, like sort of like Victor Frankenstein style. The, the, you, you would think the cat would be dead by this point, but the cat was still alive. 
the cat was literally a mobile eavesdropping device. And the idea was that like if two, you know, Soviet officials or diplomats were meeting like down by the wharf or something, if they saw a cat, nobody would react to the presence of a cat. The animal would be disregarded, which actually is sort of like a metaphor for the whole, for so much of shifters is that the animals don't really matter, they're disregarded. And the idea is the cat would pick up, um, you know, pick up whatever for the CIA to listen into. Uh, There's like millions of dollars spent on this program. The very first mission, the story goes, this might be apocryphal, there's some disagreement, but the very first mission, the cat was pushed out of a van and, and promptly run over by a taxi. And that was the end of the program, they discontinued it. And so there was a lot of stuff like that, which by the way, is for the most part, if you research it, it's a lot of, uh, it's sort of, again, comedic relief, but like definitely not funny for the cat. Um, Martha can talk more about animal partners. She's the one who directed me toward this program. I will just say one of the more fascinating things for me about this, about researching um, this, the text I wrote for this book actually was the CIA Freedom of Information Act reading room. I recommend anyone go, you know, go to it. Uh, it had all of these documents about animal partners, not just animal partners, but animal partners are public. And you have all of these memos and you have these feasibility reports. And if, if anyone out there listening, Google pigeon photographers, CIA, animal partners, um, CIA reading room, and you will find a feasibility report on using pigeons as, as maybe Marta can talk more about this too, but pigeons as spy photographers, the amount of detail down to like a pet food supply that's recommended in Wisconsin for getting like a specific type of seed for the pigeon, really astonishing. And the last thing I'll say for now is at first for half a second, you're like, oh, they really cared about the animals. Um, it's like very specific cleaning instructions to keep their coop clean and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, this is how you take care of a cherished pet. But actually it's how you take care of radar equipment. It's how you take care of like a sophisticated piece of spy equipment. It's not a, the animal's alive, but it, it, it almost isn't. It's just technology, it's equipment, that's it. As Stefan said, we use them and we care for them as long as it's useful to us. Uh, it's our interest. You know, we also research uh, scientifically animal capacities and skills as long as they can be useful to us, but we don't really give them their rights. We don't really uh, do it just for the sake of understanding them and getting better communication. I think this is the point. And also in this program, Animal Partners, uh, it was an amazing uh, I don't know, maybe fate coming into play because when I was already working on my last dummy for this project um, in September 2019 suddenly CIA decided to declassify most of these documents they were before classified and and you couldn't really access them so easily so I was like it was a gift you know suddenly happening when I'm working on this book um, not so many images though uh, but there's lots of reports uh, and texts and memos uh, from the actual actions and you know we don't really know how how much these animals were used in field operations because I don't think CIA would ever agree to to tell us really how it was <laughs> but still it was really really interesting to 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 open this you know Pandora's box and just I knew about many of these projects before already because they kind of you know were somehow somewhere digged out by some journalists but but yeah you could really you can really go as Stefan said and read and and delve into it if you're interested and uh, and also this term animal partners for me is super symptomatic because it exactly gives you this that we think they're our partners but we don't take into account any of their their needs they don't sign any contracts we don't pay the animals all the work is like slavery work you know it's like done for for free for us for ages and and how can you call a program like that animal partners it's it's hypocritical i think and that was very important the pigeons play an important part of the chapter Animal Partners, as we just discussed. Uh, but there are also two other chapters in the book that are dedicated to them. Uh, one titled The Go-Between and the other titled Bird's Eye View. And Marta, can you tell me a bit more about the pigeons' role in the book? Pigeons are actually kind of a big heroes of this book. I mean, dogs and pigeons, there's uh, so many different programs about pigeons. And, you know, first of all, pigeons were used from since ancient times as, as messengers and uh, the homing pigeons, the, the ability to like find back way home is, is very, uh, it's amazing. I recently found out that actually pigeons don't 
don't they they're not born with this uh, skill they have to learn which is also incredible so as so for example you can see it in different armies um, depending on cultural, um, let's say, way that they treated pigeons. So in France and Germany, for example, they allowed pigeons to fly on longer routes and in the night, and that way pigeons would um, actually develop more skills and become even like better at what they do. And for example, in Britain, they didn't really think that pigeons were so smart, so they actually allowed them to fly on short routes and only during the day. So the pigeons never really developed their orientation. They orientate themselves in many different ways. For example, uh, they have this, uh, you know, star compass and they have a sun compass, which they use for longer routes. But then they also have a cartographic memory that they use for like this shorter uh, flights where, where they use the terrain, like they map the terrain and they remember the maps. And then so they, they combine these two ways of, of, of navigating. It's incredible stuff. So and then you have pigeons in all these really these spy programs and, and crazy, crazy stuff. Like, for example, there was a military program called Project Orcon or Project Pigeon, where this famous behaviorist uh, was first training pigeons to to make them kind of peck on one specific point and they they were to become a, a, a missile guidance uh, pilots so they they had this specifically designed torpedoes where they were supposed to sit in and be like a kamikaze and you know sent in that torpedo to kind of co control it and you know bring it to, to to explosion but also to their own death in a way so this was like a long-term project or the project Takana which Stefan already mentions was was a project actually with a lot of different birds where you had ravens cuckatoos uh, uh, pigeons uh, pigeons were were trained to carry like these small cameras and they were supposed to to access uh, like remote uh, military bases in some Russian territories, supposedly during the Cold War. We, we know they, they, they did a lot of test flights with these cameras, and there are even pictures from those, from those flights that you can access at the CIA website. But uh, we don't know if they were actually used in like real operation, you know? So pigeons, wow, they, they have amazing stories. And they also have a... They have also these uh, individual stories. We have Sherami. This is something which is really also important, is this bringing back the individual history of animals, because we treat them as, um, you know, species. We have dogs, cats, cows, but we rarely talk about a specific cat unless it's our pet, but, you know, in the scientific way. And what, what Professor Barate also does, he, he tries to bring back this like individual biographies his last book was called uh, like the animal biographies and you have 10 very specific animal stories where you have this one giraffe this one monkey and it has a name and it has a history so that that was also a very interesting uh, point for me the, the pigeons by the way i should just say the uh, the pigeon photographs are, are pretty incredible actually um the text i wrote begins with the the book uh Pigeon Photographer, The Pigeon Photographer, which is um, published by uh, uh, Niccolo de Giorgio, uh, probably mispronouncing it, but uh, Niccolo de Giorgio, shout out, uh, he's a, a great publisher. And um, it starts with, uh, it, it, it begins actually with photographs taken um, earlier in the 20th century and goes through to the CIA. And I, I've looked at this, the, the feasibility report that the CIA, that was filed with the CIA, and the photographs are pretty amazing. Marta mentioned, Marta mentioned the, the test flights. They did test flights over the Washington Navy Yard and Andrews Air Force Base. And um, basically the pigeon had a, a small camera strapped to their chest and it was a, there was an automatic shutter mechanism and it was timed. So you could basically, the CIA could do like trigonometry or whatever with Pythagoras, I mean, figure out when the pigeon would be over a specific uh, coordinate to time the shutter to go off at that point. So like when it's flying over a Leningrad shipyard where research on nuclear submarines is being done, the photographs themselves, and I'm gonna be very careful to say that the, not the photographs that the pigeons took, the photographs that were taken by a, photo, by a camera on the pigeon. Um, we could do a whole talk just about, but Marta was mentioning like the language that's used, the verbs used to describe what the animals are doing uh, or, or is being done through them. The photographs are amazing. Like if you go on Google satellite, 
the images are kind of, they're just really junky Google satellite. It's like this pixelated mess. And yet the photographs taken with the, through the pigeon photographers over uh, Andrews, uh, over Washington Navy Yard, for example, are so super detailed. The, um, the, uh, they're so textured, the grain. I mean, it's almost like Escher level of articulation of these military facilities. That was one of the moments where I did start looking at something sort of as like an aesthetic object because the images themselves were kind of, I hesitate to use the word beautiful, but um, they sort of, they sort of were fascinatingly, um, uh, fascinating from an aesthetic perspective. But yeah, then the, so the feasibility report determines that, yeah, pigeons can absolutely be used in this way and look at the images. They're like super high resolution, uh, super detailed. You can see like license plates on cars and parking lots. And then you wanna go to the next document on the CIA you know, website and there's nothing else. So it's like this big tease. Did they use these pigeons or not? I, I mean, I assume yes, but we'll maybe never know. I'm thinking maybe we should like end on a note because I'm a bit intrigued by the legend of Stubby, uh, like a war hero, the dog. And maybe that could be like, we could dig into this as topic or this story as our, the last subject in a way to discuss. And Stefan, can you bring us into that, the hero wonder, on, uh, in a way as an end? Without, um, without going on for too long, I might just mm -hmm. super quickly in like a minute mention Jackie the baboon. Yeah. And contrast with Stubby, uh, contrast him with Stubby because I think they represent uh, sort of two very, um, they're, they're two good examples. So uh, Jackie was one of the animals that I, I was particularly drawn to a story. He was a South African baboon that he was found on his, um, his owner's farm in, in South Africa. His owner then was uh, volunteered for the, uh, to fight in the First World War and uh, he actually got permission to take Jackie the Baboon with him uh, to the Western Front. And uh, Jackie the Baboon was in the, uh, in the book I put it, The Post-Apocalyptic Trenches of Passchendaele. And uh, he was a Chakma Baboon. I did a little research on Chakma Baboons. They sleep, in, uh, they sleep in, in trees to feel safe. And yet here is a baboon in the trenches. And um, Jackie ended up being sort of blown to bits. He survived, uh, but barely, and he and his owner went back to South Africa after the war. He, they both showed signs of post-traumatic stress disorder, and during uh, the story is that during a, a particularly big thunderstorm, uh, Jackie had a, a heart attack. I would say that 90% of the stories that I researched uh, to consider writing about were kind of along the lines of, of Jackie. Um, this is really sad, and I don't want to hear the charming details about Jackie had a little cap. This is, um, this, this feels abusive. A baboon should not be in the trenches, and I don't, and I don't want to hear about. Isn't it cool that the baboon was able to, you know, hear incoming gas shells? Like, can the baboon ever unhear these sounds? Is is what I'm wondering. Um, Stubby is worth mentioning uh, before we finish because Stubby is like literally the only story I read about an animal, in particular a dog or a cat. The only story that I read where I felt like an animal was literally was like in his element, um, helping his humans in the way he could. Uh, Stubby was a, a, a bulldog or fox terrier. There's a big debate on like the dog internet about what breed he was. And uh, in the summer of 1917, basically he wandered onto the campus of Yale University where the 102nd um, Infantry Regiment was training. He ended up befriending a soldier who snuck him onto a troop transport ship to France, uh, and um, there's also a big debate: was it in his, was it in his greatcoat or haversack? Anyway, Stubby ended up also in the trenches of um, the Western Front, and he is known for doing things like running up and down the trenches, barking to alert troops to incoming gas shells, or going out into no man's land and comforting soldiers who were who were stranded, and then barking to alert medics. Uh, Stubby would also disappear for weeks on end. He would always come back, but I found that an interesting detail because it was quite possibly the, the single detail that I happened upon where an animal in a war zone exercised autonomy, exercised agency. Stubby had this independent spirit and then he disappeared for weeks on end. I really have the impression that Stubby had the time of his life, um, that he was really in his element and of like the hundred stories I read, Stubby stands out to me as like the only, the only guy who 
had a blast. Pretty much every other story was like was, was like Jackie the Baboon, where I just thought this is the most depressing thing, and humans are just an awful species. So yeah, cheerful, but <laughs> yeah. so Stubby is there some sign of hope in that story of Stubby in a way. Uh, then, yeah, I, yeah, I hope there is sign of hope that you know we can start looking at animals and understand that they're looking back at us and how this um, what does this mean for us and how we can connect to them better. There is a beautiful term that Donna Haraway uh, in one of her last uh, books or papers at least uh, mentions. She she calls something like our relationship with animals should become a responsibility, which is like with a with a hyphen, which kind of you know, means that at the same, we should be responsive to animals, but also have responsibility. So this responsibility, the term I think is amazing. And I think it's something that maybe could, we should, we should work on, you know, and develop. I mean, I'd like to thank you both so much for this conversation with you and to get all this knowledge about the, the book. It's uh, fantastic. And uh, thanks to everybody that is listening as well and watching the film and to all our collaborators as well and partners. Thank you everyone for listening and joining us here today. And yeah, thank you very much uh, everyone for listening and you should get the book. This book's gonna be, I think, I'm biased, but I think it's gonna be legendary. So. <laughs>